Good evening. It is so good to be with all of you here. It's always a great time to come and visit uh, Elk City. Had me a couple of years, and I always enjoy coming out here. Uh, the drive gets longer, though, now uh, that I'm in, uh, in Bridge Creek and not in Fort Cobb. So... I'm going to apologize in advance. Uh, I've got the sniffles or I have to reach in for a napkin. I, I figured out this week that I'm allergic to drywall dust. That is not a good thing to be allergic to when you're remodeling a house and completely gutting it. And I've been cutting drywall for the last week and come to find out, I was like, man, I'm itchy. And now my nose is all clogged up and like, oh, yeah, that's an allergy that you can develop. I had no idea. But yeah, so I'm sure you've been blessed uh, throughout your summer series as you've gone through the book of Proverbs and you've talked about wisdom, godly wisdom. I'm excited to be able to go through some additional things that we're going to talk about today. If you have your Bibles, go over, uh, go ahead and turn over to Proverbs chapter 26. We'll be reading from there here shortly. Let's open with a prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for this opportunity that we have to gather here together tonight uh, as brothers and sisters in Christ to, to study more about the wisdom that you have blessed us with in your word. We're so incredibly thankful for the devoted men of faith who, who recorded these words, that you've inspired them to to write and Lord we pray that as we study these tonight that we will take um, care and diligence to apply them in our lives to to see where we might fall short uh, of the life that you've called us to live for us to to be willing to turn from any ways that might be counter to the way you would have us to live and to turn back toward you put these things into our hearts our minds have them change us and drive us to be more like your son Jesus Lord we are so incredibly blessed to have what you've blessed us with, blessed to have this life. We're blessed to live in this country where we can gather here together tonight without fear of persecution. Lord, we're mindful that there are problems in the world. Lord, we pray that you would be with those, our leaders, leaders around the world that make decisions, that you would make good and right and just decisions, that they would appeal to your wisdom and not their own, that they would make those decisions uh, that further um, your will in this world. Again, Lord, we're so thankful for Jesus. We're thankful for his life, which is recorded for us. We're thankful for his perfect life that he lived. We're thankful for his sacrifice, his love for us, your mercy toward us and the grace that you've extended us through him, through sacrifice and through the blood that was shed on that cross. We're so thankful for that sacrifice. We're thankful for his resurrection and what that means for us. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Well, I don't know, did school start yet out here? Next week? Tomorrow. Oh, tomorrow, okay. Well, my kids were, have been in school since since Tuesday, so in honor of that, I'm going to tell a joke about uh, school and, and a little Johnny joke. It's clean, don't worry. There's a story about little Johnny, how he went home over Christmas break, or he went to visit his grandparents over Christmas break, and he brought with him a picture of his class as they went out on one of their uh, trips or whatever, and they were all seated there and some in the back. And he was excited to show his grandparents, his whole class. And his grandparents said, oh, show us and tell us about a little bit about your class. And so little Johnny pulls that picture out and he starts pointing at each kid. And he starts telling his grandparents about each one of his classmates. He says, you know, this here, that's, that's Lisa. And she's really bad at math. And she's probably going to make an F this year if she don't really get things going. And then she, he moves on and he goes, that's Johnny. Johnny's really terrible at dodgeball. And I always get him out. And, yeah, he's, he's just no good at all at dodgeball. And on and on in the list he goes down. And he finally he gets to himself after telling everything about his classmates. And he points to himself and he says, and there's me just minding my own business. We're aware of the necessities of life. Basic needs of life. You probably learned that in school. 
You probably learned about food, water, shelter, and clothing being the necessities of life. These are the things that we need to survive. I think, though, a strong case could be made to adding another one to that list. I think a strong case could be made to adding fire to that list. You ever thought about how important fire is to our day-to-day -day lives? Raise your hand if you used fire today. I used fire today in multiple ways. I'm remodeling a house, so I've burned a whole lot of stuff in a great big pit that we've dug in the yard. But more than that, I use fire to cook my food, right? If you are at home, you say, well, maybe I use all electricity. Well, there's a good chance that your electricity came from a fire that boiled some water that created steam to turn a turbine to generate electricity to go to your house. If you drove here today, you used fire, unless you're using one of those newfangled electric cars, in which case, see the last point, but if you drove here and you used an internal combustion engine, you used gasoline that created fire and pressure and combusted and then it created force to get you here. Fire is a pretty integral part of our lives. It's hard to think of right now, but in the wintertime, some of us have fireplaces, a place in which we put fire in our homes, one of the most destructive forces uh, known to man, to keep us warm. But even if you didn't use fire today directly, there's a good chance that you used something or you're wearing something or something came that you used today came from a process that came from somebody working with fire. Fire is pretty integral to our way of life. Fire is a pretty awesome thing. It's very useful. It provides us with all those ways to cook, to travel, provides electricity. What's kind of fascinating is one of the things that sets us apart as humans is our capacity to use fire, to harness the power of fire. No other animal, they may use fire, plants use fire in order to regenerate and seeds and stuff like that, but no other animal purposely creates a fire in order to cook or to do anything like that. We do that. Not only is fire kind of critical and crucial to us as a species, fire in times past has been integral to being a people of God. Genesis 8, we read about the first time that fire is used in worship to God. Now, there's a chance that it was used for that, but this is what we have recorded for us, the first time it's recorded. Genesis 8, Noah gets off the boat after the giant worldwide flood. And it says, in starting at verse 20, Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took some of every clean animal, some of every clean bird, and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And when the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma, the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground because of man, for the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I ever again strike down every living creature as I have done. We go a little further down the story of God's people, and we get to Leviticus 6, starting in verse 8. And as the Lord is giving Moses the commandments for the priests, what they are to do in the tabernacle, notice what he says. He speaks to Moses saying, Command Aaron and his sons, saying, This is the law of the burnt offering. The burnt offering shall be on the hearth, on the altar, all night until the morning, and the fire of the altar shall be kept burning on it. And the priest shall put on his linen garments and put on his linen undergarment on his body. And he shall take up the ashes to which the father fire has burned or reduced the burnt offering on the altar and put them out beside the altar. Then he, else, he shall take off his garments, put on the other garments, carry the ashes outside the camp to a clean place. Again, the fire on the altar shall be kept burning on it. It shall not go out. The priest shall wood, burn wood on it every morning. And he shall arrange the burnt offering on it, and it shall burn on, on it the fat of the peace offerings. Fire shall be kept burning on the altar continually. It shall not go out. That's a lot of burning. And I don't know about you, I would be curious to know how many ricks of firewood that 
the Israelites would go through in a year, keeping this fire continually burning. That's a lot of wood. Fire was integral to pleasing and following out the commandments of God. So not only is it uniquely human, it's unique to the people of God. But fire has a dual nature, doesn't it? We get all the benefits from fire. We understand that fire is extremely useful and beneficial. It's a powerful force for good when it's harnessed and used in appropriate ways, but it also can be an incredibly destructive force. Fire, when it doesn't stay contained, which it doesn't like to do, can become extremely destructive. The same fire that you put in your fireplace that creates warmth for you in the winter and keeps you alive, perhaps if your power goes out and that's your only source of heat, is the same fire that's capable of burning your house to the ground. The fire that produced in the internal combustion engine that gets you on down the road is the same fire that can melt your car into a puddle. The fire that we cook our food with can burn our, food, burn our homes to the ground. The fire that we you know, enjoy cooking our marshmallows on out in the wilderness can create a forest fire that spans miles and miles and takes out miles of forests and miles of homes. All that comes from fire when it gets out of control. What we know about fire is something we understand from a very young age. We, we are taught to appreciate the power of fire and the fact that it can get out of control and be dangerous. And you may be wondering, what does that have to do with Proverbs? Well, good question. But in order for us to understand the wisdom of Proverbs, we have to understand some the things that Proverbs says that certain things are like. And we have to understand that fire is an extremely valuable resource, but it also is something that can be extremely destructive. And there's something else in our life that is both extremely useful, in fact... It blesses our lives greatly. It allows us to, it's a unique gift from God, the same way that we're unique in that we manipulate fire. But it can also be just as destructive in our lives as an out-of-control fire. Proverbs 26, I know in the lesson, or in the book, I talk about 20 through 22. I really uh, am going to talk about more in Proverbs than that. I actually kind of want to start in verse 18 tonight. Proverbs 26 and verse 18 says, Like a madman who throws firebrands, arrows, and death is the man who deceives his neighbor and says, I'm only joking. The book of Proverbs has a whole lot to say about what comes off our lips, about what our tongues say. And one of the favorite things that the Proverbs writers like to, like to go into is the fact that what we say is likened to a fire. The kind of things that we can participate in with our speech, which is a, an incredible God-given gift, can also burn things to the, to burn relationships, friendships to the ground. Speak can be destructive. In this first instance here, in 18 and 19, we read that a man who deceives his neighbor and says, you know, I'm just kidding. I didn't really mean it. I was, I know I was deceptive, but you caught me, and now it's only a joke. They say this is like a madman who throws firebrands. What a firebrand is. It's a fire arrow. You set the arrow on fire. You shoot it over the wall. You're trying to set the enemy camp on fire, or wherever it lands, it's going to set on fire. Now, I don't know about you, But when I think of a mental image of fire out of control, I don't know that you can get more out of control than fire on a flaming flying stick, right? It's going to go somewhere, and whatever it hits is in danger of being out of control. You're not going to be able to stop it. You may not know where it's going. You're just kind of sending it in a general direction, and what it burns, it burns. And so we we have this introduction here in Proverbs 26 of an uncontained and careless fire linked with deception of speech. And this gives way to verses 20 through 22. 
which is really what I wanted to focus on kind of the remainder of the evening. He shifts the dangers from deception to that of a whisperer and a quarrelsome person. Continue to read here. He says, For lack of wood, the fire goes out, and where there is no whisperer, quarreling ceases. As charcoal to hot embers and wood to fire, so is a quarrelsome man for kindling strife. The words of a whisperer are like delicious morsels. They go down into the inner parts of the body. I want to continue with 23. Like the glaze covering an earthen vessel are fervent lips with an evil heart. The trait here that I want to focus on tonight is that of a whisperer. When you have the mental image of somebody who's whispering, what are you thinking of, especially in this context? You're not, I don't, you're not talking about somebody who, in the middle of service or maybe while I'm speaking, remembers that they need to say something to their, to their friend next to them and they're, they're trying to be discreet. That's not what we're talking about. The kind of whisperer that's mentioned here is a whisperer who's whispering because they don't want other people to know what they're saying. Not that they're, they're not trying to be polite, they're trying to be impolite. In this context, a whisperer is somebody who gossips, slanders, and talks behind other people's backs. I want to talk a minute about the definition of these things. Slanderer is somebody who says something false about somebody else. If I tell somebody that you did something that you did not do, that is slander. That is lying, which goes up to many other things in Proverbs. It talks about lying lips. But a gossip can also... uh, Well, let me start over. A gossip could be saying something that is true. um, And it can still be gossip. I think a lot of people misunderstand what gossip means. A lot of people think gossip means that it it has to be untrue or it's not gossip. You can still gossip about people and the thing be true. What does it mean to to gossip, to slander? Well, really, what it boils down to, in both cases, is you're trying to spread information without the other person knowing that you're doing it, and your goal, in most cases is to affect or impact that person's reputation. You're either trying to tell a lie about them so that their reputation is hurt, or you're trying to tell the truth about them without them knowing it or telling information that they wouldn't want other people to know in order to affect their reputation with others. Now, one has to wonder... Why is God so concerned about this? And then, on the flip side of that, why aren't we? I think all the time, when I think about sins, and we think about repentance, and we think about the things that we need forgiveness for, I think we're pretty focused on the big ticket items, if you will, the things that are are always hit upon in our culture, right? We really want to think about, well, I've changed. I'm no longer a a murderer. I'm no longer a homosexual. I'm no longer this. Uh, Some of these bigger things that we might look at, no longer a drunkard. But I think sometimes, especially in our culture, we tend to overlook our speech and the impact that our speech can have on our walk with Christ. I will be honest with you. If I look at myself and I do a little bit of introspection on myself, it is probably the thing that I struggle with the most and with good reason. It's very tempting. I want you to pay attention here to verse 23, no, 22. It says, The words of a whisperer are like delicious morsels. Now, probably can't tell it, 
I'm a fan of dessert. I really like it. It's wonderful. And this is kind of what this is getting at. This is the, the thing that we want, he wants to put in our mind as he says, the words of a whisperer, the words of a gossip, the words of a slanderer are like delicious morsels. They're like dessert. We love to hear it. We love to taste it. It's sweet. It's good. It's wonderful. Why is that? I think the issue is that many of us have problems in our lives. Do you have problems in your life? I do. Are you perfect? I'm not. And so our egos like to be reaffirmed. We hear things about other people, especially if they're negative things, and we think, well, at least I'm not that bad. At least I didn't do that. That makes me feel pretty good. I'm not that person, and so I must be doing all right. And one might think, well, what's, you know, what's the big deal about that? Notice what else it says. It says they go down into the inner parts of the body. This isn't just saying like a dessert where you, you eat it and it, uh, you know, it goes down into your stomach. This is saying this goes deep into us. What we listen to and what we hear when it comes to the form of gossips and, and slanders and whispers is stuff that goes into our deep inner selves and it affects us greatly. It's kind of like a dessert in that way. What is the old, I think the saying is uh, a moment on the lips and eternity on the hips or something like that. It, it affects the inner being of us and, and God understands this. And I think the reason that He is so fiercely against this is because one of the very, well, the very first sin, the fall of humanity, involved a form of slander, of whispering, of gossip, right? You go to Genesis chapter 3, and you look at Eve there communicating with the serpent. And, and what does the serpent say? Did God really say? Did he really mean it? Wait, perhaps God is just keeping something from you. You know what that is? That's slander against God. God wasn't keeping anything from them. And yes, God really did say. But what did that do to the mind of Eve? It put just enough doubt in there for her to carry out her own desire. Speech, like fire, is completely amazing. Have you ever stopped to think about how incredible it is that we can communicate it's amazing that we can communicate and, and carry out complex conversations, that we can communicate complex ideas through speech and text. We can write it. We can speak it to one another. Uh, we can tell each other how much we love one another, how much we care for one another, how much we enjoy one another's company. We can encourage one another with the speech that we have. We can praise our Lord and our God with the speech that we've been blessed with. Speech is an incredibly useful and wonderful gift that we've been blessed with by God. But, just like fire, it has a downside. There's a tremendous amount of good that comes from speech, but when speech gets out of control, it becomes a problem. And it can also, just like fire, consume relationships and friendships. I want to read a few scriptures here. We talk about slander, gossip, whispering. Leviticus 19 and verse 16 says, You shall not go around as a slanderer among your people, and you shall not stand up against the life of your neighbor, for I am the Lord. Psalm 101 and verse 5 says, Whoever slanders his neighbor secretly, I will destroy. Psalm 140 and verse 11 says, Let not the slanderer be established in the land. Let evil hunt down the violent man speedily. Proverbs 10 in verse 18, the one who conceals hatred has lying lips, and whoever utters slander is a fool. You may be thinking, well, you know, that's a whole lot of Old Testament Scripture. Let's go over to Romans chapter 1. Turn over there with me. 
I'm going to start in verse. Yeah. 28. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. And notice what they were filled with here in 29. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. Stop there. Evil, covetousness, malice. Let's look at the list of things that are involved in those things. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. I think in our society, we are, and we ought to be. This isn't a slam against anything regarding this, other than to say we got to be careful. We are huge proponents of the First Amendment. Bill of Rights, freedom of speech, and that is good, and that is right, and that is important. I think that's something that we ought to uphold, but we have to understand that within our walk with Jesus, within our walk with God, what we're supposed to be doing, just because we can say whatever we want doesn't mean that we should. There are certain things, many things, that we are not supposed to do with our speech. Why? Because speech is a gift given to us by God and it is to be used to glorify Him. And any action that He says does not glorify Him is not speech that we should be actively involved in at all. Now I want to say that the reason I brought up the whole fire thing, right? you probably think, what, what did that have to do with that and where are you getting to? So many years ago, before I went to Fort Cobb, I was at Bridge Creek before and I was a volunteer firefighter there for five years. And I, I got promoted on up to the rank of captain, did all the training courses because they want you to know as a firefighter, they want you to understand how fire works because if you know how fire works, you are a more effective fighter of fire. So I'm going to teach you something tonight that is important to fighting fire, and it's something we had to learn in Firefighter 1. It's called the fire triangle. More modern you know, there's another, there's a fire tetrahedron now, I think, and it's got more things. But for our purposes, we'll do the fire triangle tonight. And the fire triangle teaches us what all fires need to burn. There are three things that a fire needs to be able to burn, and that is fuel, air, or oxygen, and heat. Fuel, air, and heat. It needs all three of those things to continue to burn. If you take any one of those things out, the fire will go out. You are familiar with this. Most usually, the thing you think of when you fight fire is water. Firefighters take water to a fire. They're putting it on the fire in an effort to cool it off. They're trying to remove the heat. If they remove the heat, it doesn't matter how much fuel is there. It doesn't matter how much air is there. The fire goes out. You may also be familiar with if you have a grease fire in your kitchen and you don't throw water in it. If you throw water in it, that water will instantly boil. It'll throw the oil all over the place and then you've got more heat, more fuel, and you didn't get rid of any of the air, so it's just going to keep burning. Instead, if you know the fire triangle, you've got your pan, you put the lid on the fire, the air goes out, the fire goes out. You can't burn. Hotshot crews, when they go into these big forest fires, they don't drop them behind the fire line with big old giant tanks of water for them to carry around so they can fight the fire. Instead, what they're looking for is a place where they can create a fire line. They can remove the fuel from the fire, and so that when the fire burns to it, it has nowhere to go. 
Without fuel, the fire goes out. I want us to think about that with our speech and with our lives. Because I think if we carry that fire science with us, we can associate that with what the Proverbs writer, the wisdom of God, is telling us here in Proverbs 26. Because notice what he says here. He says in verse 20, you know, it's funny how sometimes we have to go through these, you know, classes and the wisdom of men think they've come up with something clever like the fire triangle. Uh, you know, when God through his wisdom has told us these things uh, for, for time, times beyond, right? Verse 20 says, for lack of wood, the fire goes out. And where there is no whisperer, quarreling ceases. It's no surprise to us that when you take the fuel out of the equation, the fire goes out. Perhaps, I want to ask this question. Have you, ever, have you ever worked at a job where you had a person who fits the bill of a whisperer? A gossip. Slanderer. Someone who, in an effort perhaps to work themselves up the chain of command or to get themselves to a promotion or up to a better job, someone who likes to say things about others, and they create strife in the workplace. Have you ever experienced that? I have. It's no fun. I remember being in a meeting one time at Chesapeake Energy, and I thought that I thought my uh, my boss was going to have to invite one of my coworkers to step outside. It got so tense. And it, that man ended up getting fired, and the level of peace that was in the office after he left was amazing. Fighting stopped. The quarreling ceased because the wood, the whisperer, had been removed. He says in 21, As charcoal to hot embers and wood to fire is a quarrelsome man for kindling strife. Again, we get this same idea. There's fire already in place, but if you throw wood on it, what happens? It kindles the fire, strife. Not surprised by that. And so here's what I want us to think of. The solution for a potential out-of-control fire is what? We don't say there has been some really horrific tragedies through, throughout the ages due to fire. Untold numbers of people have perished when cities caught on fire and the whole thing burned. Yet, our solution is never, well, we should just ban fire. We should get rid of it. No more fires, and then that will solve all the problems. We don't want to do that because, one, we can't. Fire is a naturally occurring thing. But, two, we wouldn't even if we could because fire is too valuable. We use it for too many things. It's too useful to us. It's such a blessing when it's contained. And so here's the point that I'm trying to make. Speech, too, is extremely useful. Just because there's the potential to misuse it doesn't mean that we should get rid of it, but we need to be vigilant. We're vigilant when it, become, when it comes to fire safety, aren't we? We as a society, and, and around the world, we have societies that have said, you know what, fire safety is important. You need to have fire alarms in commercial buildings. You need to have fire sprinklers in places. You need to do all these things and have fire exits. You need to prepare. Be ready. Be vigilant in case of a fire. In schools, we do fire drills. I was a teacher last year at Fort Cobb. It's the bane of our existence. Those fire drills. We're in the middle of doing something, and we all have to go outside. It's important. We do those things. Here's the point I'm trying to make. When a fire, because of the danger of fire, we're vigilant in detecting when it might be getting out of control. And as Christians, we need to be vigilant in noticing when our speech might be getting out of control. And there's some ways that we can do that. There's some, I want to I provide you with the fire triangle in an effort to try to get you uh, uh, to understand and to think about some things.
I want to turn over real quick to James 3 before I do that, though. Because I would be amiss to not read this tonight. James 3. I would select a few verses to read here, but I think it's important that we just read the 1 through 12 here. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we, we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For we all stumble in many ways, and if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. If we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at ships also. Though they are large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder. Wherever the will the pilot directs, so also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. Pay attention, our friend the fire is back. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird and reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a reckless evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, a good thing, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God a terrible thing. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening, both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives? Or a grapevine produce fig? Neither can a salt pond produce fresh water. James wants us to be aware that the tongue is dangerous. It's just as dangerous as fire. So in our day-to-day conversations, we need to be aware of what we're saying and who we're speaking to and what other people are saying. Because those things matter. They go into us. And then what comes out of us shows us what's in our hearts. Some practical things for you to, to think of when you're in a conversation. I don't know if you know this. Firefighters can be pretty gossipy people. I remember when I was volunteering, I, we would come back from a call and we'd all be standing around the truck as one does and then eventually, inevitably, the gossip would start about somebody. In those situations, and I'm sure you've been in them at work, in conversations around the water cooler, in the break room, wherever the case may be, here's what I want us to think about. Are we going to sit there and eat it? Are we going to allow that conversation to go down into our innermost being or are we going to treat that for what it is poison a burnt cookie burnt to a crisp not something we want to ingest and because we know that fire requires fuel we have an option we can sit there and become part of the fire or we can remove ourselves and remove the fuel from the fire You know, slander and gossip can't exist if there's no one there to listen to it. If we just walk away, can they continue on in their gossip and slander? The answer is no. Now, I think we have to be careful in how we handle this, too. If it's a brother or sister in Christ, I don't know that it's something that we should walk away from. Perhaps we should make it known. Hey, perhaps we're crossing into a, a gossipy situation here. Maybe we need to cool it. Maybe there's a way that we can handle this discussion in a better form or we can invite that person in so that they're here so we can have a conversation if it's something that they really need to hear and work on. Another way that you can avoid gossip is by removing the air. And by that I mean removing the air of your lungs. Don't do it. Don't do it. I was thinking about this all, you know, I have... There's several applications, and you can break this down as much as you want, but I got to thinking about how we could avoid and put out the fires of gossip and slander and and how we could make that happen when in the world around us, I think there's always heat. I don't know that we can ever get rid of the heat. 
especially here in Oklahoma in the summer. The heat is there. There are people that are willing and ready to just say whatever because it makes them feel good, and there's not much we can do about that. But what we can do is not repeat what we hear and not want to hear it in the first place. Remove ourselves from the situation, and we can stop gossip. Instead, we ought to replace it with speech that encourages, that builds up, that helps. There's all sorts of things in this world that needs to be done and said, and that's what we ought to be focusing our time and attention and effort into. My son came home from preacher training camp last week, and he was saying how much fun it was, and how much he, he's gone, he goes to Camp Lujo, and he loves that, but he said, you know, this preacher training camp is my favorite camp of the year. And I said, yeah, well, why is that? And he said, because we're learning how to make a difference. I don't have to tell you what the world is like. There's a lot of hate. There's a lot of slander. There's a lot of issues going on out there. If we will take God's word out into the world and tell people what it says, if we will encourage others to walk in accordance to the scriptures, if we will convince others that Jesus is worth following, it's the only way that we're going to make a difference in the world. It's not going to come through legislation. It's not going to come through political power. It's going to come from the kingdom of God. That's what we need to be proclaiming. Don't Phil, don't give in to the world around us. Make sure that you're ready and vigilant over your speech. I had a joke I wanted to close with. The more I think about it, though, it's, I don't know if it's funny or sad. One day there were some preachers out fishing. You're already going to like it because it's a preacher joke. Preachers out fishing one day, and the, you know, the fish weren't biting, so they, they got together. They said, well, you know, let's help tell some of the, our worst sins that we really struggle, struggle with. And, uh, so the first preacher said, you know, well, I really struggle with, with gambling. It's something I've struggled with since I was a young man. Next preacher says, you know, I, I, really, I really struggle with, uh, uh, putting football and, and sports, you know, over my family. I, it's something I really struggle with and I'm trying to do better at that. And the third, uh, they turn to the third man and say, yeah, hey, well, well, what do you struggle with? And, and he said, you know, I really struggle, he smiles and says, I, I struggle with gossip. Gossip in the church has hurt more people than I think we can ever imagine. We are supposed to be a people that hold things in confidence, that are here to help one another, not to hurt. If you're struggling with that, or if, it's, if you've been hurt in the past, I want to say, um, I'm sorry. And you should know that that wasn't something that God would approve of. And as you move forward, make sure that it's something that you don't do to somebody else. Thanks. Good evening again. I had a whole lot more to say. I ran out of time. I was going to talk about David and Mephibosheth and how he was slandered. Mephibosheth was slandered by Ziba. And if you want to go look at that, you can. It's pretty interesting. But I'm going to instead skip on down to our perfect example here. One of the reasons I think Christians fall into the temptation of slander and gossip is because we, have, we develop a mentality sometimes that, well, they deserve it. Have you seen what they did? I'm just telling the truth, and man, it's evil, and man, it needs to be talked about. We run into that a lot, I think, with our political figures.
and we like to say a lot of horrible things about them, but we don't get a pass because somebody is evil. We don't get a pass because somebody's going to do something awful, even if we know it to be true. And I will point us to Jesus for that fact. Jesus knew from the beginning who Judas was. He knew that he was going to betray him. He knew that he was a thief, that he would steal from the pot to pad his own pockets, says in John. He knew all of this, and yet we have no indication that he treated him any differently or loved him any less than any of the other apostles. He washed his feet. He ate around his table. He was there until the night he was betrayed. And I know that he didn't even give any indication. There was no side eyes. There was no talking to John. John, you really need to be careful about this Judas guy. There was none of that. And I know that's the case. Because when we look at the gospel accounts, especially there when he's instituting the Lord's Supper, I'm in Luke chapter 22. As he's instituting the Lord's Supper in chapter 22 and in verse 21, after he has given them the bread, after he's given them the cup, he says, Behold, the hand of him who betrays me is with me on the table. You know what the apostles didn't say? Oh, that's Judas. Oh, yeah, yeah. We, we know. We could tell. Wait, Jesus, you've been talking about him behind his back. We know who you're talking about here. We know it's that guy. No. What'd they say? And they began to question one another, which of them it could be who was going to do this. Who is it? Who is, it? is it me? Some of them. In other accounts go, is it going to be me, Lord? It's not going to be me. They had no idea. Judas was going to betray our Lord into the hands of the enemy to be tortured and killed. And yet, there was no grumbling, there was no whispering, there was no malice. He was loved, he was fed, and he was served. I think we would do well to remember that. Yes, I understand there are people that do evil things in the world. Yes, I understand that it's hard to understand people like that. We're not called to understand called to love We're called to serve We're called to be what jesus was to walk in his footsteps to be like him and jesus used his speech always to glorify the father we should do the same here tonight and you struggle with slander gossip gossip or if you're hurting if you're ready to obey the gospel whatever your need i know there are men here love to help you any way that they can. You can do that as we come or as come now as we stand.